You are entering an investing state of mind the system doesn't want you in. The truth. You want answers? Michael Covell has them on the Trend Following Radio Network. And now, reaching over 130 countries and territories, Michael Covell. Today on the show, I have Mark Minervini. Mark is the author of Trade Like a Stock Market Wizard, also featured in Stock Market Wizards by Jack Schwager. Mark comes at trading from a different perspective than trend-following traders, but with a lot of commonalities. I think you'll enjoy this conversation. You know, one thing I noticed about your world, and it reminds me of my world too, you definitely love those outside influences, the motivation, the persistence, the passion. I've seen that sprinkled throughout uh, your book and just around you. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Well, you know, I came from a very, well, to say the least, a modest beginning. So I had to read a lot of books and uh, get a lot of books and tapes early on in the day to uh, get me motivated and to uh, learn how to get a successful mindset. So I have, uh, I often point out that I have all my books behind me in my uh, office, over a thousand books on motivation and success and uh, finance. And uh, so I'm a big, uh, I'm a big reader and uh, I like to, uh, I wanted to also uh, in my book be able to motivate people. And because if you're not motivated, you don't believe you can do something, then it doesn't matter, you know, if we give you the strategy or not, you still won't be able to, to get it done. Yeah, I think you make a great point about some of the motivational books. I think sometimes I've seen a lot of naysayers over the years and they'll say, oh, that's just happy talk and whatnot. And I had some really strong influences from some of those books. And I still remember an Anthony Robbins book that struck me on how Steven Spielberg went out and figured out how to be a director. It was really just getting close to people that had already done it and finding mentors. That was very influential to me. So I always... I always, I always usually pause when someone discounts these books and, and, and whatnot. For, for 20 bucks, you get someone's life experience. It's a pretty good deal as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> yeah. Hey, listen, what do you, before we jump into some of the trading, since you've already kind of gone there, why don't you start with some of your background? If, if I'm not mistaken, you did not follow the typical schooling path, did you? No. Mine's about as untypical as you can get. For someone who ended up on Wall Street, you know, I, I quit school at very young in the eighth grade. Uh, I was only about 15 years old uh, when I stopped going to school. Um, I was actually a musician very early on and was uh, was a drummer and later on went into the recording business. And that's what ended up uh, financing my, my first trading account was I sold off some recording equipment and uh, put it into the market and and that's how I started trading. Okay, before we get into trading, since you've brought it up again, favorite drummer, who was influencing you at the time? I want to know. <laughs> at the time? Well, back in the day, probably John Bonham from Led Zeppelin and Neil Peart from Rush, who probably were two drummers that were influencing everyone at that time for the rock guys. But I, I, mean, I listen to all kinds of music. To this day, I, I like everything from funk to to rock, to blues, to R&B. So I, I like everything. I was kind of guessing Bonham actually myself before I asked the question, just given, given our ages and whatnot. Um, sure. Okay, let me, let me jump into the trading. Going through your book, and at the end of this, you'll have to tell me how you ended up meeting Jack Schwager. But going through your book, going through your book it, it, was, it was easy to see that in some ways our, our, our worlds are, are – are, Going in very similar directions, we're looking to capture that big trend. But you probably come at it, you, you're coming at it in a different perspective, a different way. You're using different tools, different mindsets, different strategies. But ultimately, I think it's fair to say you are looking to capture, and you use the phrase super performance, which until I knew exactly what you meant by that, I would have just called it something else. But it's the same thing, which is just capturing a massive trend. Yeah. Well, first of all, I mean, you can get super performance in a few different ways. You can you can get a big 
giant winner that might account for uh, a big portion of your your profits in your portfolio, or you can get a bunch of smaller winners. Um, I started off when I first started trading. Uh, commissions were very high. They were $175, $200 a trade, and you weren't able to go in there and trade back and forth like you can today. So you you went in there looking for a double or a triple at, at a minimum. But then later on, as commissions came down and you were able to then execute through the internet, you could start doing more short-term trading. And now, of course, now we have day trading and people go in there for you know fractions of a penny even with uh, high frequency trading so um, you know there's a there's multiple ways to skin the cat it doesn't the, my way isn't the only way and uh, there's no best way it's whatever works for the particular person makes sense to you fits your personality and uh, but it's all about managing that risk versus that reward so you know it's just if you have big reward you can take more risk. If you have smaller reward, then you have to manage that risk even more tightly. Well, I know the, the classic the classic risk management precepts are throughout everything. And you're probably your number one rule is to cut your cut your losers short. And that I mean that's that's just classic. And people hear that and I, I don't know if you've got any good anecdotes or stories about cutting your losers short, but you know, people probably think it's trite to continue to hear it and but it's so damn important. If you lose all your money, you can't play the game. Yeah, well, cliches are cliches for a reason. And, um, you know, I, I actually uh, tell this story in my book on how when I was being interviewed by Jack Schwager for market stock market wizards, um, he at one point stopped his tape recorder and said, you know, Mark, this stuff is great, but this is what all the uh, the guys, you know, previous in the other books, they all said pretty much the same thing, you know, is anything new or different. And I said, well, that's why they're all great. You know, that's, <laughs> it's, it's pretty, ba- it is a lot of, you know, basic fundamental principles that you have to adhere to over and over. So, you know, I'm big on the sort of the, uh, Vince Lombardi, uh, method where, you know, we're going to learn to run, block, tackle, and, uh, and pass, you know, better than everybody else and, and leave the, uh, the tricky stuff to, uh, to some other guy. You know, that's a, that's an interesting story with Jack. Uh, what did you feel at that first moment when he was saying that? What was your thought when he turned the recorder off? I was like, Oh no, <laughs> you know, <laughs> uh, I hope I'm not going to have to start making stuff up to make this interesting. I felt like maybe I was, you know, uh, going to be boring and, um, that, you know, talking about these, these fundamental principles. We know we're going to be not what he was looking to hear because he had already done two books prior. So, you know, to, and he interviewed some of the greatest traders ever. So I realized that, yeah, I was saying a lot of things that were already being said, but you know, that was, it was the truth. And that's all I can do is tell how I do it, you know, and that's, that's what I tried to do. Look, your, your, your book is deep. So it's dense. There's a lot of material and there's no way we could break it down in a short conversation today. Yep. But let me get people to understand how you approach your day. Because, for example, just to make a comparison, and as you're saying, hey, there's, there's different styles, different strokes, different folks. Yep. But in the, you know, in the, in the classic technical trend following way, you might not even have to look at the screen during the day. In your world, that's different. Why don't you walk people through your world and how that's different. You know, the main thing is, regardless of what the strategy is, the main thing is that you go in with a plan. You know, I have a, a very well thought out plan every day. Of course, I've been doing this now for 30 years, so it, it, it comes very naturally to me now. But in the beginning, you have to really think about, you know, how you're going to respond to certain things and what triggers are going to make you get into a trade and and out of a trade and and really try to have as full of a plan as possible going into the day. So, um, you know, I do that planning the night before when I'm unemotional and like right now <laughs> and, and uh, you know, 10 o'clock at night, I'm, I'm in front of the computer and I'm looking for stocks and doing research and getting ready for the next day. So when that next day you know, the market opens, I already know what I'm looking at, what I'm looking to buy, and I'm not calling audibles throughout the the day. So that's one of my rules is to not call audibles. Don't try to make something in the middle of the day that you hear a story and then all of a sudden you start trading something that you haven't done research on. Go in there with a, a plan that's already, uh, you know, pre-figured out before you even start the, the day. Yeah, I think that's 
I mean, it's obviously wise words. And I get back to your point with Jack. People might be looking for you to say something uh, that they go, what? Well, I feel like I've heard that before. That's that's not necessarily new, but that's the way it's done. Yeah. Well, well, you know, people a lot of times are looking for that the magical answer. And of course, you know, there aren't really many magical answers. It's 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 work and just like any other business. Um, but it, just because something is simple doesn't mean it's easy. It's just like you go back to a Beatles song and you can play virtually every Beatles song on a, you know, acoustic guitar or a piano and their basic chord progressions, but that's what makes them so genius is that you take these basic you know, progressions and make them so beautiful and melodic. So things, just because things are basic doesn't, don't mean they're not, that they're not powerful and they're not effective. Yeah. It's a great point with the music. I love that. Let me go back to one of your early influences. So I believe his name was Richard Love. Yeah. And super performance stocks. And like I said earlier here is that I had not heard the exact phraseology of super performance stocks, but once I, Read it, I was like, oh, wow, okay, stocks, and correct me if I'm wrong, stocks that are up 300% in a two-year window. That's right. Yeah, well, Richard Love is, uh, you know, was back in the 60s and 70s and studied the big winning stocks and figured out what those stocks had in common. Uh, Later on, William O'Neill did the same thing, um, and I believe O'Neill – uh, probably read Richard Love. Uh, I, I know some of the other people that O'Neill was uh, gravitated to uh, early in, in the 60s and what influenced him. And he turned his computers on and, and uh, found pretty much the same conclusions that Richard Love uh, came to. So it was very interesting to me that, you know, looking at these big winning stocks and finding out that, wow, they had certain things in common, just like maybe if you looked at an athlete, a pro basketball player or a football player, and you found out that they're taking certain vitamins and having a certain regimen and there's a certain mode of thinking or they're reading certain books. And, um, you know, you find out, wow, these guys all have uh, some common denominators here. And that's, uh, to me, that was very scientific. And I like the fact that, you know, I can, I can, have something that uh, would give me some confidence in my plan that there was some science behind it. And also, too, it was not about diversification. I'm not a big fan of diversification beyond uh, what's the minimum amount of diversification that you can get away with with not putting yourself on the line to uh, to a level where you can get you know torpedoed and get yourself in big trouble with one or two stocks. But I like this, especially for someone who has a a small to medium size account. You know, I try to get in all my money in four or five, six stocks because you're not going to get super performance if you're in, you know, 30 or 40 names and you're diversified all over the place. Plus, you won't be able to move very quickly and you won't be able to know everything that you need to know about those individual uh, companies. So it's better to be concentrated. And, uh, but you don't want to, of course, have all your money into one stock. You can wake up the next day and you're down 70, 80% on some, some gap. But if you had all your, if you had your money in 25% positions, even if the stock the next day gapped down 50%, it would, it would impact your portfolio 12.5%. You can recover from a 12.5% you know, total equity loss. Of course, it would be a pretty big loss, but it's recoverable. But if you lost 50 or 60 or you know, 80% of your portfolio, that's hard to come back from. You know, as I bring up Richard Love, and I believe the book was called Super Performance Stocks. Yes. So I don't know if this was at the same time or in the same general time frame. Richard Donchian is definitely an early influence of yours. Yes. Richard Donchian was uh, definitely an influence of mine. He uh, was one of the influences that had me add in uh, the uh, the trend and the technical um, analysis part where putting the, not only the long-term trend but also sort of stacking time frames and having the shorter term trend also be uh, where, where it's moving in the, in you know my direction so yeah Richard Duncheen was another one um, there was a book called stock market blueprints uh, by um, uh, I believe it was it was Jensen. It was uh, Edward Jensen. That was another book that was uh, instrumental for me. Um, there was the relative strength concept uh, by Levy. That was, that was another book. And then, of course, Jesse Livermore was my. He was sort of my trading hero. And uh, and uh, and uh, Paul Tudor Jones was one of my later sort of uh, mentors that I really gravitated to uh, his style. 
Let me ask you first about Livermore. What struck you about Livermore? What did, you know, you said almost uh, kind of a distant mentor for, from reading about him and his, his work. What struck you about him? What did, what really influenced you about his work and his life? Well, I'll tell you, there's a common denominator in what influences me. I, I tend to gravitate towards things that uh, appear to be timeless. Like, I'm not looking for something that just works now. I want to see something that has worked for, you know, if I, Livermore, his concepts that were working back in the 20s and 30s, I was seeing the same thing in a modern time frame. Same thing with Richard Love, same thing with O'Neill's work. You can go back to these guys that, you know, did these, these great studies and had these great careers, and you find that this stuff is timeless. You know, it's, it's not like it just was a, um, uh, something that happened to work as a fad. So I've tried to, over the years, to really gravitate to the strategies and to the people that have found those timeless treasures and then put them together into a strategy that is based on that. So it, it in itself becomes timeless, uh, going forward. Yeah, timeless is a word that, I don't know. I think so much of the population, they just want that, uh, they want that shiny new, uh, iPhone 5S. And if it's not the shiny new iPhone 5S, well, those other phones before it didn't even work. They were all useless. Uh, they didn't count. Hey, let me jump into the Paul Tudor Jones comment though, too. Uh, I noticed you mentioned also in your book, uh, the picture with him where it says losers, average losers. Yeah. Behind his head. I have to, I think I'm actually responsible for that, for finding it in a magazine. You might have seen the same magazine, like 20, almost 20 years ago and photocopying it, putting it on the internet. Um, <laughs> so I don't know if you actually said anywhere else, but such a great picture. Why don't you just break that down as a teacher would? Let's kind of pick a big picture principle here because that picture is so awesome. Losers, average losers. Someone's not heard that before. They don't know what it means. You're in front of the classroom. You're teaching losers, average losers. I know it's terribly important to you. Why should it be important to who's listening now? Well, losers, average losers is just referring to averaging down or adding to a losing position. So you're putting, you know, uh, good money after bad. So if a stock you buy it at 20, you must love it at 15, right? And then really love it at 10. But that's that's a way to the poor house very quickly. If you're wrong and you keep adding to a position that's moving against you, you can really have a catastrophe on your hands. What was really powerful for me was to see somebody as successful as Paul Tudor Jones, first of all, that needed to put that sign up on the wall. <laughs> and that was first impressive to me that, wow, you know, here's a guy that, you know, is tremendously successful, but he still has to remind himself. So it just go, it, it made me realize that how compelling it is to be, to add to a, a losing position and how important it was to remind yourself, uh, constantly. Plus that losers, average losers to, to me is a really dramatic statement. I mean, that's a very, very big statement. So, um, you know, I, I just felt like if, uh, someone like Paul Tudor Jones had to, uh, remind himself of that on a regular basis, it, it had to be pretty important. And I have, I also had up until that point have had experienced my own, uh, you know, setbacks where I would add to positions that were down and then ended up suffering big losses. So I, I had some real life experience to go along with that, uh, realization. Yeah. There's a motivational aspect to that too, isn't there? Oh, yeah. Yeah, because I mean, and, and I know I'm fairly certain that Paul Tudor Jones has had a uh, close affinity or appreciation, and I mentioned him earlier, Anthony Robbins. And so I, when I look at that, and some people might say, well, that's a little aggressive. And, you know, he's saying something uh, negative about other people. I think he's holding him, he's holding himself to the same standard. It's not like he's just pointing fingers at other people. He's putting it on his own wall and saying, this applies to me too. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, Paul Tudor Jones was one of the one of the be the great risk managers and did it with a you know a tremendous amount of money. Um, so uh, again, you know, I, I that was uh, someone who I uh, uh, had a lot of respect for and still do. Let me jump into some other just big picture principles. Don't just buy what you know. I I, I, I so many people reach out to me and they they'll say, well, can I can I do uh, the particular trading strategies on FX alone, just currencies alone, or something? And I. I sometimes wonder what, what's going on at people's noggins. Cause I'm so used to the, the diversity of trading opportunities, but you know, don't just trade what you know. Then again, this goes back to really like studying what produces these big winners and they're not normally 
companies that you've heard about or are very popular, you know, like an IBM, it's been around for many years, may have its time and uh, from a bear market may put the stock down or uh, and then they'll have a, you know, a nice move in the stock. But to make these really big, what we call super performance moves or these velocity moves, very often it's a company that you never heard of. So you, you have to be willing to uh, research companies that you, you, may, you may have never heard of. And, and investors get, are uncomfortable with that because they feel really comfortable going in there and buying Google because, of course, you know, Google's not going to go out of business. Everybody uses Google. Um, so if it's a household name, it gives a sense of comfort. Uh, but you got to kind of get out of that comfort zone if you want to find those big super performers. But now Google at one point in time was the super performer. That was the, the one that nobody had ever heard of. Well, that's exactly right. And if you go back and you take a look, I mean, I can remember when Dell Computer, nobody heard of Dell Computer. I can remember when Amazon, I bought Amazon and Yahoo very shortly after it was an IPO and it was moving into new high ground and nobody knew those names. Um, and of course now they're household names, but when they made their big, huge moves and when I was involved in those uh, stocks in the late eighties and the, and the, the early nineties, um, I couldn't find anybody that even knew, you know, what those companies did. Well, you just mentioned the phrase, uh, and, and I'll let you expand on it. New high ground. You're, you're not afraid of buying higher highs. Well, here's the thing. Now, of course, at some point when a stock tops, it'll make a new high, and uh, that'll be the ultimate high point. But if you're going to make a really big move in a, in a stock, let's just say you know you happen to go in there and, and buy a stock that uh, uh, is down uh, it, from its high, and it's off 50 or 60 percent. Well, that stock, if it's going to make a big move, it's all, to get back to its old high, it's only going to go up 100%. Now, that may sound like, wow, only 100%. 100% is a big move. But when you're looking at a price line or some of these stocks that have gone up for, or, you know, Yahoo, I bought Yahoo, it went up almost 8,000% after I bought it. When you're talking about that type of move, the only way to make that type of move is to make a new high all the way up. Because again, even if the stock was down, cut in half and then it came back to its old high, it's only up 100%. From that point on, it's all new highs. So you really have to make new highs at some point to make a really big move. And, and that's why so many investors don't participate in those really big moves because when the stock hits a new high, they think that this, it's too high and, and that it can't go any higher. But very often it's just the beginning of the, of the move. Well, it opens up the door on psychology because at that, at that all time high, many people say, well, let's just wait for it to come back some. Let me, let me, let me let it retrace a little so I can, so I can buy it cheaper. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that, that works both ways too. Sometimes somebody's at a loss and they say, well, when it, you know, when it rallies back, I'll sell it and I'll, and I'll, and I'll get out at break even or, you know, like you said, the stock goes up and they say, well, I'll wait for it to pull back and then I'll, and then I'll buy it. And then, of course, it never really pulls back very much. And then they're sitting there, you know, oh, well, I could have bought that. I could have bought that stock at 20 bucks, uh, you know, and years later, the stock's up four or five hundred percent. So I, you know, I've heard that many times. You know, regardless of uh, trading strategy and kind of as I spoke about at the very beginning, you know, you and I might come from slightly different directions, but trying to get to the same place to find these big moves. But there is, uh, I think, with any and back to your point with, with Jack Schwager, but back to, to any great strategy, any great achievement in this world, the risk management aspect, the, the optimal risk, your bet sizing, these are so foundational. We could have conversations all day long about uh, entry, exit, whatnot, terribly important. However, the risk management, I mean, this is, this is what keeps you in the game. You said you've been in it for 30 years. It's been your risk management, correct? Yeah, it's all about longevity. I mean, I often say, you know, you can, uh, you know, if you don't, if you don't have some type of risk management, I mean, even Warren Buffett has some type of situation that will let him know that the decision he made maybe was a wrong decision. I mean, it's not every decision that Warren Buffett makes isn't correct. Uh, you know, none of us can make a hundred percent perfect decisions. So we have to find some way of uh, admitting that we've made a mistake. Things are going in the wrong direction. And manage that risk. But if you're not using some type of stop loss on your trade and you're a stock trader, it's like driving a car without brakes. You know, you may get away with it for a while. You may be able to drive around, you know, around your block and down the street. But 
you know, how long do you think you can do that before you get into an accident? Eventually, you're guaranteed to have a, a, a major crash. So, you know, that, that's, that's basically the way I look at it. And uh, regardless of the strategy, you have to manage risk. That's what it's all about. How did you, you seem so calm, cool, and collected. Is this you all day long? No. <laughs> <laughs> when does it change? <laughs> what happens? What, what was, what, what, is it, this is the 10 o'clock at night, Mark. What, what happens? Yeah. No, well, I'm very passionate and very emotional, but I'm, I'm also, a, I guess I'm a pro now. I've been, done so many interviews and so, and been at it so long now. It's kind of, uh, I, uh, I concentrate hard on being out, trying to deliver you know, uh, 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 the information that will be helpful to people. And that's really been my focus, you know, in the last several years is to really try to be able to get these things. So it's one thing to talk about them and to uh, talk about your success, but to take that and to be able to turn it into helping others is kind of, there's, there's a few facets to it. First of all, you have to explain it to them in a way where they can actually understand it and really grasp it and, and then internalize it. And then there's the other aspect that you have to convince people that you're not special, that, you know, you're not, you're not gifted in some way, that they can do the same thing and they could do even better because they have the benefit now of your, your work to build upon. You know, records are made to be broken and every record's broken at some point. So, um, so, you know, I've really been focusing on trying to be very deliberate in the way I, you know, deliver this information. And, you know, writing the book made me be able to really look at all this stuff um, over and over and really to be able to understand a little more how to teach it uh, as, uh, as opposed to, you know, I spent all those years just at a blistering pace of just trying to make as much money as I could in the market. Uh, you know, now I'm trying to uh, take that and to be able to transfer it to other people. Let me let you go big picture for a second. So, New traders, new investors come into your world, and, and maybe we've already touched on some of these these issues, but new traders, new investors come into your world. What are some of the biggest misconceptions, if not the biggest, when people come into your world and they want to learn, they they want to, to, to start to figure this process out? Where do people start wrong? Yeah. Well, it's a long list. You know, it's, <laughs> it really is because it's a, it's a, it's not an easy thing to, to, uh, to do at a high level. Um, you know, the discipline is really the, the main thing. You know, you, you, you can be very smart and, and intellectualize this stuff over and over, but it's the same thing, you know, I mean, are you stupid because you can't stick to a diet? I mean, there's, I'm sure there's physicists out there that, uh, you know, that, uh, try to diet and don't, don't stick to it and, or, uh, try to get in the gym and, and don't, uh, stick to going to the gym. And, um, you know, it's all about discipline. And, uh, so that comes from, you know, how bad you want it and how bad you, be- how much you believe that you can actually, uh, get to that other side of the, uh, of the tunnel. Um, so I, I think, you know, the discipline is really the main thing. But what I try to do and, you know, I, I have, at my master trader program, we, at my seminar each year, I always tend to have these certain moments. And I now after doing it for five or six years, I know when they're coming so I can really deliver it effectively. I have these aha moments where the entire audience just goes like catatonic. And I can, I can predict when it's going to happen. There's a, the risk management part. Uh, there's certain segments of the risk management part where the entire audience just completely just goes like like deer in headlights and you know there's certain things that when you really show them how much it makes sense and then they can really believe in them then they can start cutting those losses because it's really hard to you know a stock moves against you and you're, you're selling it at four or five percent or even eight or ten percent and then it turns around it takes off and it doubles or triples and you're not in it and you're saying well i'm never going to do something stupid like that again um, i should have never went and listen to Mark Minervini. I'd, I'd have a hundred percent gain if I just held that thing. But it takes a lot of time where you, you know, you get torpedoed a bunch of times and it doesn't work out so well. And, and then when you understand, when you have a real understanding of why you have to manage that risk and how losses work against you. And, and like you said, position sizing and all those various aspects and you really get a real understanding of it um it gives you the confidence then to go out and, and actually do it there's a whole you know a whole list of things that uh you know people do i can i mean i can go through some of them if you if you'd like if you want to spend a little time on it 
we've touched on some of them for sure. And I, I think when you, when you say something like, uh, you know, position sizing at risk management, I mean, obviously that's a topic where you and I could talk all day long. I think the key here is to get people to, you know, when you're addressing it, you're saying, Hey, this is it. Losers, average losers, risk management, optimal bet size. These things are terribly important. I think what you're really saying to people is, Hey, you got to take it a step further and go dig in as well. Yeah, well, first of all, you're not going to have success with any strategy and speculation if if you're not able to cut your losses. <clears throat> I mean, that's just universal. All right, if that that's there's there's no great trader out there that's sitting there and adding to losing positions and hoping and praying and and uh, throwing caution to the wind. Eventually, you know, you're carried out on a stretcher when you do that. So uh, that that's first of all. So yeah, that that's now the other thing too is you have to, you know, you're asking me where people go wrong. Well, they go wrong with the reason that they even get into trading. Believe it or not, some people are trading because it's just exciting and fun. You're not going to make a whole lot of money if you're trying to get excitement. If you want to get excitement, maybe you know you should go bungee jumping or something. But even though trading is exciting, that can't be your motivation. Your motivation has to be to the money, you know, to the success part of it, and and that has to be really important. So that's when you. You cut your loss, just like poker players. You know, there's guys that get in there and just love to splash uh, chips around in the pot, and you know they, you'll see their stack will go up real fast, and then it'll go down real fast, and it's all over the place, and uh, um, and eventually, you know, they lose all their chips, and and they had a real, you know, exciting, exhilarating, and then disappointing you know, ride. It's the same thing with the stock market. You have to realize, you know, why are you even doing this? You know, is it an exercise in ego? Is it an exercise in self-destruction? Or is it you're actually approaching it like a business? And I find a lot of people go into it. They don't approach it like a business. One of the problems with the stock market is that the ease of entry. I mean, you, all you have to do is just open an account and you're a stock trader. There's not too many other professions that you can do that at a high level. If you have, want to be a doctor, you have to go to school. You want to be a lawyer, you have to pass the bar exam. But with stock trading, you just open an account and you're a stock trader. So it gives the appearance that it's a lot easier than it really is. Yeah, you open it, you open the account and you are now an expert. Uh, <laughs> you know, I was thinking about your poker example. I had a chance to speak to Howard Letterer a few years back and he mentioned an example one time. He sat down at a table and it was mostly, he was the big name and it, he's a famous name and mostly new, uh, new players and whatnot. And he quickly lost a lot and, or, you know, he, he, he hit his, he, he knew what the tables was at, the cards were at. He lost a lot. He stood up and left and they were all kind of like, Hey, what's going on? Why are you going to sit here and play with me? But to him, it wasn't just a game. It was like, look, I'm, I've got risk management in my head. I've just lost the amount that I'm willing to lose. I'm done. Yeah. Yeah, well, I, I I love Howard Letterer. He actually used to play at the uh, club that I played in New York, the Mayfair, which is not there anymore. But he, um, you know, I have the same exact type of rule when I play poker. Uh, if I lose a, a few buy-ins, then and I just and I I, I end the, the the session, I end the day, and I uh, I start again another day. So um, you know, I do the same thing. I'm not going to just keep losing over and over and over again. That's sort of the same thing as adding to a losing position. You know, I mean, just get yourself to uh, pound yourself into the ground like that. So you have to have some type of uh, you know risk management always. Yeah, it's funny. You're up against as you try to give all this sound wisdom, uh, much of it uh, inspired and influenced from many, many mentors decades back. It's tough because when you you flip on the tube and there's going to be plenty of people listening, and I'm sure people will listen and they'll learn some lessons. But there's plenty of people listening that will then go ahead and turn on TV and, and watch financial news shows for uh, six hours uh, the following day. And, you know, that information... Uh, I guess for some strategies, perhaps is useful, but the the constant watching it, it just seems to be uh, something designed to gear people up and get them excited, but it doesn't really take you anywhere. And I, I just uh, I, I I'm I've railed against so many of these things for so long. I can't even rail against them anymore. But it it is just not uh, it's not a useful endeavor to 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 get glued to the excitement aspect of this. Yeah. Well you're being very kind, you know, and I'll I'll say it I'll say it a little more bluntly, and that is that, you know, you shouldn't even turn on the TV you know, as a stock trader. Um, you know, I, I uh you know I like to call my my shop or my research, my business vacuum packed. 
Um, I try to keep everything internal and not really listen to what's going on outside other than, you know, I, I try to gauge sentiment and things like that. Uh, but, uh, and then I'm, and then I'm, I'm fading it. You know, if everybody's saying one thing and I happen to be in that same camp, I have to start questioning my own, my own opinion if it's the same as everybody else's. Um, so, so, you know, I, I agree with you and I, you know, I would, I would say, you know, turn off the TV. I think I even have, I think it's uh, in my book. It's tune out the media. It was one of the subheads. You know, tune out the media, and um, if you if you know what you're looking for, and you you have a good strategy, um, you don't need to listen to anybody else. And that that's the whole goal of of I guess any real you know a profession, but certainly in stock trading is to be able to get competent where you don't have to turn on the TV and see what Kramer says or or check the news or check if somebody just upgraded your stock to give you the confidence that you should hold it. Uh, you'll you'll know what you're looking at and you'll know what you need to see uh, that things are working and you'll also know what you need to see uh, to tell you that things aren't working and that you should get out. Can I tell you, my only time that I turn it on is if there's uh – and typically in stocks, if there's some big unexpected down day, uh, and I can still remember back to the summer of 07, that's when it's kind of exciting to watch CNBC when they're going crazy. When there's that, when, that's what it's for. It's a pure entertainment, nothing to do with trading or making money, but pure entertainment of just to watch the newscasters go crazy when uh, the narrative has broken and they're surprised. That's uh, that's kind of a sadistic form of entertainment, perhaps. But uh, <laughs> yeah, so. well, to be fair, there's lots of very smart people that show up on CNBC and these shows, but there's also uh, lots of opinions that are completely contrary to each other and there's a lot of noise and um it could be very confusing if you if you try to uh you know listen to all these opinions because not only the the stock market but everybody's opinion will validate virtually you know every type of thought that you can have if you're you know positive on the market and you feel bullish there's always some something out there that'll that'll uh, reinforce that if you're negative there's something that'll reinforce that and you really have to be able to fall back on your own expertise and have uh, you know, some confidence in your own abilities and, and your own strategy and know, know what you're looking at and know, know how to make those decisions and ignore that stuff. Yeah, you make a great point because you, you're right. You can flip on uh, and see perhaps an interview with a, a Sam Zell or a Carl Icahn. And, you know, if they're just talking up their book, that's not necessarily useful information. But just like we were talking earlier with Paul Tudor Jones and the sign behind him, some of those men that have been around for decades do uh, instill uh, and infuse uh, some of their pearls that they've learned along the way. So I, I, I definitely uh, just to. Just to say, it's not all bad, but yeah, I guess it's hard to, you know, you know, you got to get a good mentor, and and it's important that you, you know, believe in what you're doing and make a real commitment to it. I guess going back to you asked, you know, what are some of the mistakes that uh, newbies make? One of them is that they drift off their style and they mm. they just keep bouncing around trying to find sort of that magic. Uh, that magic uh, method, and very often, you know, what you have something in your hands that is uh, a capable vehicle, uh, but it takes time. It takes a lot of time. It doesn't happen overnight. Uh, it takes time to learn any strategy or perfect uh, any method. So, um, you know, again, you know, there's there's lots of ways to skin the cat, but you have to make a commitment to something, and you got to be persistent and stick with it. It's better to really know everything you can about a strategy that may not even be the best strategy, but you happen to be an expert in it, than to know a little or nothing about a whole bunch of strategies. Absolutely. In fact, I apologize for not making that note. It was actually number three on my bullet points to discuss with you today was style drift, but yeah. uh, you're, pretty, you're pretty easy to go in a lot of different directions with. Hey, Mark, listen, what's, where is the, it's getting late there for you. Where is the best place for people to go to get into your world? Of course, they can tre- they can. They can check out your book, Trade Like a Stock Market Wizard. That is everywhere. But I'm assuming markminervini.com? Uh, well, I have my, you know, my website is minervini.com. And I'm also, I try to, uh, I try to stay on Twitter as much as I can throughout the day. I'm on there pretty much every day and also, uh, on stock twits. Uh, so those are, those are two places where a few, you know, I'm, I'm, uh, it's free, and I'm uh, tweeting out information uh, pretty much pretty much every day. I try to go on there, and uh, and I speak with people and uh, converse and uh, and give some of my comments. 
Where can I, where can I find examples of you not being calm, cool, and collected? Where, where does that exist? You come into my office in the, in the middle of the day when things aren't going so well. <laughs> can I call you, can I call you then? <laughs> you won't, you won't talk to me then. I mean, I'm much better now. Back, you know, when I first started, I used to break my office. You know, I'd break my chairs and break screens and things. Oh, and come on. That's good stuff. It wasn't, you know, I mean, it was, wasn't very uh, smart. I just had to, you know, get new chairs and new screens. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh, I'm pretty. Uh, I'm a lot calmer than I used to be. But I'm older now, you know. <laughs> <laughs> hey, listen, good stuff. Um, I appreciate you taking the time today, Mark, and uh, have a great rest of the night. Yeah, you too. It was a lot of fun, and uh, hope it's. I hope it's been helpful for people. Absolutely. Thanks, Mark. Yep. Take care. Bye bye. If you want to learn how to be a trend following trader. The first place to go is trendfollowing.com. My firm can help you with educational, research, and systems trading packages to get you started immediately. Take advantage of my 15 years of experience. Take advantage of all the insights that I've accumulated and put into one research and educational package. These are systems that you can use immediately to start making money. Once again, go to trendfollowing.com.